So it's a great pleasure to introduce Emery Berger. Uh, Emery Berger is uh, here at Microsoft this year as a visiting researcher, uh, uh, formerly at uh, University of Massachusetts, actually going back to the University of Massachusetts next week. So if you want to talk to him, uh, this next week is a good time. Um, it's really a pleasure to introduce Emery. Emery is a, a distinguished researcher in many dimensions. Um, uh, one of the things he's very well known for is his work on memory management, and he's going to talk again today uh, on MeSH, uh, memory management. But Emory's won uh, numerous awards for this kind of work, including um, uh, d uh, most influential paper awards for work on Die Hard and work on uh, um, just recently on, uh, uh, what is it, uh, <laughs> Horde. Yeah, the, yeah. Emory really established, uh, you know, uh, a new approach to understanding uh, memory management for parallel computers. And really, that, that influence from Horde, uh, you know, almost 20 years now, has actually really affected the entire field. So um, with that, I'll, I'll, you know, Emory had many other distinguished, uh, distinguished awards. And uh, you can look at the, the bio to see them. But with that, I'll, I'll leave you to hearing about the latest. So All thank right. you. All right. Thanks a lot, Ben. Um, yeah, so actually, um, I, had, uh, I did a lot of work early on on memory management uh, quite some time ago. Um, like during my PhD, uh, and then for a few years after that. And then um, uh, I spent an awful lot of time doing all kinds of other things. Uh, so while I've been here, for example, I've been working on spreadsheet analysis, um, which is not the same as memory management. Um, and we also have done like programming languages for crowdsourcing uh, and analyzing surveys and a new kind of profiler and all kinds of other stuff. Uh, but uh, but this is like bringing you back to my roots, so it's kind of fun. Um, all right, so I'm going to tell you a little story. I like to tell stories. Um, so this is a story of the impossible dream. Um, I don't know how many of you have seen Man of La Mancha or know what this is in reference to, but this is about Don Quixote, um, and Don Quixote was uh, this kind of like messed up knight figure uh, who had had dreams of of reconquering all of Spain. Um, so he was going to help take back Spain from the Moors back in the day. Um, so I'm going to tell you a slightly different story. It's a story of the Malik of La Mancha. Um, and he's going to Malik all of Spain, okay? which is much more challenging, it turns out. All right. So, uh, so he, here's Spain. Um, and uh, and you know, it's all, all owned by the Moors, so he's going to start conquering it. Uh, so this is him conquering Spain. So here's a Malik. All right, so we got a piece here and a piece here, and you can see things are going pretty well, right? He's going further and further south. Uh, this, is, this is not actually how Spain was reconquered, but um, <laughs> anyway, so that's not historically accurate. Anyway, so, um, but you know, you get down to the south, and then uh, sometimes there's some setbacks, um, right? And uh, you have to free some memory, uh, you have to free some more memory, but then it's time to like m conquer a bunch of space. It's like, all right, we're really gonna take over a bunch of space. So the question is, how on earth do you conquer this much space? You can see like Spain is kind of like, uh, it's all like broken up into small parts. Um, so it'd be great if you could just like tetrasize them and just kind of move all those pieces. And then you could just like conquer a big swath all in a row, right? Malik a big object. And this would be great. Um, th that's the right exclamation point. Um, okay, so um, unfortunately, uh, you can't actually do this. Um, so this is really uh, tilting at windmills. So. Again, for those of you not familiar with Quixote, uh, he's, again, I mentioned that he was messed up. Uh, and he saw windmills and thought they were like, like dragons and, and tried to, anyway. So, uh, so that was a bad idea. And it turns out that trying to like, move objects around like this can also be a bad idea. So I'm going to explain why. So this phenomenon of things all being moved around, like all being kind of like in different places, uh, is referred to as fragmentation or if you prefer, fragmentacion. Um, OK. Um, all right. So um, the way it works is you have a bunch of objects, and the objects have been malloced, right? So they're all carved out. Uh, and you have space on this page. And you can't necessarily reclaim it to use it for more objects. All right? And that phenomenon is called fragmentation. Uh, and you, it's often measured as a fraction of the amount of space that you've actually consumed over the amount of space you actually needed. Right? You needed these live objects that you called malloc for. But you didn't necessarily care how many pages they were in. If they're in a bunch of pages because they're all spread out, that would be bad. All right. Uh, this number can be large. Um, you would like it to be one, but it could be a lot higher than one. Um, there's a classical result from 77 that says that it can be as high for any memory allocator up until the one I'm going to tell you about today, um, of course. Uh, it could be this bad. 
Um, so the 13x is just f- for sort of like exposition. It could be even worse. It's uh, relative to the log of the size of the largest object over the size of the smallest object. So the bigger that ratio is, the more, your, the more memory you could end up consuming as a multiplicative factor. So if you only allocated objects of 128K and objects of size 16, uh, then it could be 13x. All right, so that's not great. Um, so what if we had compaction um, or compaction? Uh, that would also be good. All right, so that would be awesome because then, you know, intuitively you could squeeze out all the space, right? You do this Tetris thing and you compact everything, and that would be great. Um, uh, unfortunately, uh, like I said before, you can't do it. And so you might be asking yourself, well, why can't you do it? Um, you know, just because you said so, or because Quixote is messed up, or something. So no, the problem is, is that Quixote runs into his much more serious uh, enemies than, uh, than windmills, and it's these two guys. Um, if you don't recognize them, they are uh, Kernahan and Ritchie, uh, and they invented this thing, which is the ultimate opponent uh, to, uh, to compaction, called the C programming language. Um, and I want to draw your attention to this. This was totally an accident, but it suggests its destiny. So notice... The windmills. So um, anyway, um, all right. So so they they created the C programming language, uh, and you know the C programming language, of course, led to the C plus plus programming language. But these are reasonably old languages. You might think, okay, that, those were bad ideas. We could all agree. Um, but it turns out there's even modern languages that suffer from this problem. So uh, this is the Swift programming language. Um, And so I was at a talk by Chris Latner, and Chris explained why they don't use a garbage collector in Swift. Uh, And so what he observes is that uh, garbage collection uses three to four times more memory than their standard memory management approach. And if you can read the small print, that's a paper I wrote. Um, So uh, so that was kind of cool. All right. Uh, So it turns out there are very good reasons to not use garbage collection. Uh, Compaction would be nice, but garbage collection turns out to consume a lot of space already. And if your goal is to consume less space, then getting garbage collection in the mix doesn't necessarily help you. All right? So unfortunately, we're in this world uh, where people are basically using these allocators that don't permit compaction. And I'll explain again why that's the case. Um, and people have written a little bit of code in these languages. Uh, and they're on like machines. And they're consuming memory, and sometimes too much. Um, and they've even written programming languages that are written in these l- programming languages. Uh, and they inherit all of the problems of those programming languages below them. All right? Fine. So those are those programming languages. But we already know that it's possible to solve this problem if you have garbage collection, right? And so there's a whole slew of programming languages. This JavaScript, the good part, should also be much smaller. Um, but anyway, um, there's a whole slew of them that actually do allow compaction. Right, so let me just walk you through a little bit about how compaction works so that you'll really understand what the problem is. All right? so, uh, so this is compaction in action. So what I'm going to show you is uh, we're going to move all of these yellow objects off of the page on the right onto the page on the left. All right? So how do we do that? Well, the important thing is when we move an object, like we're going to move the yellow object on the far right, and we bring it in here, we have to update the pointer that points to it. I can't point to the old position anymore, right? So we always have to be able to update the pointers. So as we go moving objects, right, we keep updating all these pointers, updating all the pointers. And once we've done that, now we're actually in an OK position. As long as the world sort of is like everybody was going to go to those objects, but now they're going to the new place, that's all good. We can go ahead and free the space that they used to occupy. All right, so this is terrific, right? And that's essentially how compaction works uh, at a high level. Now, unfortunately, in C-land, uh, there's some complications. All right. So, um, for example, uh, when you compile C code, uh, it doesn't contain a lot of information, and you can make it contain even less information, uh, which is fun, using strip, which removes all the metadata. Um, and the situation that you're left with is that there's actually no way to distinguish pointers from ordinary numbers or data in your program. So let me explain concretely. Suppose you have an object at dead coo, and we want to move it to beef coo. All right, so uh, that sounds fine. So I need to go through memory and I need to find all the pointers and update them from dead coup to beef coup, right? Seems straightforward. But this could just be a number, right? This could just be a number in your program. There's no way in C to know whether it's a number or a pointer. And so if you are like, I'm just going to move this pointer, but it turns out it was a number that your program depended on, God knows what will happen. 
All right? Um, a, a cow will die one way or the other. But anyway. All right? But it gets worse. It gets worse. So you're thinking, OK, that seems maybe surmountable. Maybe somehow we could have type information, something, something. N no, you're confused. But, but it gets much worse because C is terrible, um, terribly awesome, um, or just terrible. Um, so here is, so basically, this slide is showing you that you can actually hide pointers in C. So you can't find them. And it's completely legit. So in this case, we have a union where you actually jam uh, two objects together. They occupy the same space. And so we're going to create a pointer. This is a pointer. And now I'm setting this flag. I'm oring it to, uh, with one. So that means that the bottom bit, like the last bit, will be a one. That's not a pointer to anything. All right? So even if you go looking for pointers and you know where pointers are supposed to be, they're not necessarily even going to be there. All right? So game over. We're screwed. Well, there's nothing we can do. Thanks for your attention. OK. Um, all right. So what I'm going to talk about today is something that apparently does the impossible, which is it actually allows you to do compaction with, somehow without relocation for C++. Right? So I'm going to be able to compact objects, but somehow I'm not going to move them, which seems crazy. And it will become clear how that magic is actually possible. Uh, the magic goes further. You don't have to change your program in any way. There's no recompilation required. In fact, there's no compiler required to do this. Uh, it's just a runtime library. Uh, so you replace a runtime library using an environment variable. On Unix, this is LD preload. Uh, and that's it. And when you do it, you automatically get memory savings. So I'll show you a few examples. Uh, so this is an execution with Firefox. Uh, so it's Firefox using its default memory allocator versus using mesh. Uh, and you can see the top line here is the default allocator, and then this is mesh. And it's actually, as you see the, the thing moving to the right, it's doing compaction. So it's saving memory. Um, here is, oh, and I should add, this was, yeah, with less than 1% performance overhead. Um, all right, uh, so here's Redis, which is a well-known uh, data structure store um, and widely used one at that. Uh, and so this is the amount of space you get without compaction. There's actually a, an ad hoc weird compaction mechanism that they put into Redis where they uh, are kind of in bed with JE malloc and they know something about how JE malloc works. So they go and they free all the memory, copy it into another space, and then, co and then allocate it again in the hopes that it'll be jammed together. Uh, and this works OK. Uh, it turns out it's not great. But Mesh does it without any ad hocery. You just use malloc and it works. And it's even better. And uh, it's also faster. So if you just use mesh, it's five times faster at compacting memory than this ad hoc strategy. All right, great. So, uh, so here's the like the little mini reveal. So it's compaction without virtual relocation. All right. So I will explain what that means. Uh, but there's going to be some relocation here. It's just not going to happen in virtual address land. All right. So let me show you what that means. So, uh, so we refer to pages as being meshable uh, intuitively when they can be combined in some way. That is to say that they, their objects don't overlap. So the way I like to think of it is suppose you have objects on a page that are here, and you have objects on a page that are here. And if you can jam them together so that they don't actually physically overlap, so you don't have a situation like this where one gets clobbered, then they mesh, all right? like gears meshing. Okay? So, um, what we're going to say is that pages are meshable and they hold objects of the same size class. That just means the same size, in essence. So we group objects of certain sizes. Like if you ask for um, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, if you ask for six, not 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, et cetera, it'll be rounded up to some size. All right? Um, it's also the case they have to be non overlapping, as I described. All right? And then here's the, the magic that we do. So, Computers have virtual memory and physical memory. So uh, not all computers, it turns out, but not embedded systems, but computers that we mostly care about um, often have this distinction where there's addresses that are visible to the user, and then there's addresses that are visible to the operating system. And then there's some mapping that is preserved, usually by uh, some sort of uh, hardware support, like a TLB, that permits automatic mapping of these virtual addresses to physical addresses. And these are at the granularity of a page. Right? So this could be page number one. This is page a million. And as far as the user is concerned, these could be consecutive in memory. This could be page two and three. All right? It doesn't know about those. However, it's at the granularity of a page, of a whole page, not individual objects. That's really important. 
So you can think of all of your memory as living in this. This is the normal way the world works. Like your virtual addresses, it's just the pages are kind of moved around, but all the objects are in the same place. So what we do with meshing is we go and we find a virtual page that we want to compact. And we mark it as read-only to prevent anybody from updating it while we're actually doing the meshing process. And then we copy out all the things that don't overlap. So what we've done is we've taken all the objects from this physical page over here and put them over here. And we know that they don't clobber each other. This means that we can actually point that virtual address, that virtual page, to point to this physical page. So as far as the user knows, no addresses have changed yet. But we've actually moved the objects down here. And through some like Linux commands that I'm not going to explain, uh, we can then update these page tables. And we then resume, and we get rid of the physical page. All right? And the key thing to note is we haven't changed any of the virtual addresses. Now, there's obvious bookkeeping that we have to maintain. Like We can't be like, now let's try to allocate some of the empty space over here. That doesn't make sense, because some of that empty space is not empty space over here anymore. right? So we actually have to go and update some sort of metadata that says, no, 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 no. Like These things are actually occupied now. All right? Yes? When do you release the virtual page for the thing that got meshed? Um, I mean, we can so release it immediately. No, the, uh, let me think about this. I mean, so the virtual addresses have to be have to be maintained, right? They do. Yeah. That's right. Right. So, so there's that page is allocated until you until you can deallocate both. Do you mean the virtual page? Yeah. Yeah. The, the okay. Page. Yeah. Yeah. So okay. So there's physical pages which consume actual memory, and there's virtual pages which only consume address space. Right. Well, right. And, and there's page table size. That's right, exactly. Um, and so we're mostly concerned with the former, which right. is reducing memory. Uh, reducing the size of the page table is not a big deal. But it is true that we can't release the virtual page until it's totally empty. Right. Yeah. yeah. So that's a good observation. But that's not a problem. Um, we eventually do release it when the objects go away. All right? Yes? While meshing is active, our writes are delayed for the pages that you're Machine? Yeah, yeah. So what happens is, uh, so we use page protection. So again, all modern systems that aren't, you know, um, are IoT devices uh, have virtual memory, and they have a way of saying, look, you can't write to this page, or you can't read from this page, or so on, without triggering a signal. All right. And so what we do is we actually take, as we're going and meshing, and we identify these mesh candidates. When we're about to move something out, we protect the page. So anybody who's trying to write to the page is blocked. Uh, and then the meshing occurs, and then we resume, and then they get to continue. That's exactly right. Yes? So is this specific to the allocator uh, that is being used by the thing? Uh, so this replaces the memory allocator entirely. OK. Yeah, you can't just plug this in. Okay. Or, uh, uh, yeah, so you would have to modify the allocator uh, to, to support this. So in fact, um, there are people at Google, I presume as we speak, uh, who are trying to, to roll this into TC malloc. Uh, and there's some effort to roll it into, so that's their allocator. Uh, there's an allocator used by Facebook called JE malloc, and there's some effort to roll this kind of thing into J malloc, but it's the mesh itself. There's like the mesh ideas, and then there's the mesh algorithms, and then there's mesh just replaces malloc. So you would have to do some meshing inside another allocator to make this work. Yes? I find it astounding that you can find enough of these pages to make this worthwhile. So are you changing yep. the way allocations happen? Yes. So we're changing the way allocation happens, but it's also, so here's this insight, which is, uh, it, it's obvious in retrospect, which is that uh, the more space you free up in making things available, like when compaction would matter, the more likely it is there's empty pages lying around. right? And so the time when you need to do compaction is exactly the time when there's lots of these pages that are sparsely occupied. Um, yeah, that wasn't obvious. To, like we were like, oh no, what about this case? It's like that case doesn't matter. The only case that matters is when there's lots of free stuff, like lots of fragmentation. All right. So one thing I haven't mentioned. Oh, I'm sorry, you had a question. One quick question. So yeah. Because of this um, uh, read-only bit that gets set here. Yeah. Does this does, does this potentially affect the semantics of some program, for example, of some sort of concurrent program? Um, I believe it does not, um, but it does affect performance. So it runs the risk of um, slowing down a program if there's contention. 
uh, but we do it only a page at a time, and it's a pretty quick operation. Uh, but semantically, with respect to the memory model and things like that, uh, which I think is what you're yeah, alluding yes. to, um, it does the necessary flushes and everything like that. So I think that all of the like all the pointers uh, are become uh, are updated before we release the uh, the memory. I'm pretty sure we're doing it right, but you know, memory models. Um, yep. <laughs> there's always some risk of insanity. Uh, so far, we've not encountered any issues. So that's a great question. Yeah. So um, the fix size that you mentioned, right? So yeah. is it a power of two or is it can it be any? Fix um, size? No, it can be any size. So we actually use the same size class algorithm as JE Malloc, uh, which makes it a fair comparison with JE Malloc. Um, so, but you could use any range of size classes. Okay. Right. So, so the question, just to be so everybody understands, um, when you go and you allocate objects, it's typical in memory allocators to do some rounding. So you could round up to the next power of two. That is bad because you're potentially wasting 50% of your space, right? So if I allocate an object of size 17, I get 32. That's really at odds with what we're trying to do, which is to reduce memory <coughs> consumption, right? So what we in fact do is something that's more logarithmically growing, um, so it doesn't uh, it doesn't consume that much extra space in internally. So the fragmentation within that size is quite small. That's, yeah, that's right. That's, that's right. Different. Exactly. Yeah. So this is again one of those things. So fragmentation is this weird term. Uh, and it, most people think of it in, ter in the terms of like Quixote in Spain, like I described. But it's also the case that you can allocate an object like I want 24 bytes and I get 32. And that inside wasted chunk is referred to as internal fragmentation. So we make sure that that is also small. Um, the great part about mesh, this is a small de like aside, but right to your point, um, is that be the big problem with having very fine size classes in, in general is the risk of fragmentation. And we're actually fixing that. So we can have pretty fine size classes without any risk. All right, so one thing I have not mentioned and that may, not, may have occurred to some of you is there's a worst case that I've not talked about. Um, and that worst case is what if we have pages that have very few objects on them, but I can't mesh them, right? So here I have two, object, two pages. They're virtually empty, but by very bad luck, they each have an object in the first position which means I can't do this, right? They clobber each other. So that's not good. You can imagine a, a far worse worst case, right? Um, right? Like everything is unmeshable. That would be really bad. Um, and so you know, this may seem like ridiculous, and maybe we don't have to worry about it. But unfortunately, the way that standard allocators work and the way that programs typically uh, actually allocate memory, it makes it much more likely that this kind of event will occur. So let me explain why. So a standard allocator, uh, you're going to go and you're going to request memory. And when you request memory, you get a piece. And then when you request more memory, you get the next piece, and the next piece, and so on. And this leads to these kind of runs of allocated objects. And so you end up with things basically kind of striding in some deterministic way. So it becomes likely that you get these big stripes. And then those stripes are very likely to collide. And you only need one collision to make it fail, right? You can't mesh if even one object collides, right? So this is a big risk. Yes? But the runs of objects increase the locality of the objects, right? Um, yeah, you so that's, that's, an, that's an open question. <laughs> uh, so the question is, like, oh, isn't it a good thing, in essence, uh, to have objects allocated next to each other? Because this is good for locality. Because when you go and you access this object, maybe this other object gets brought into cache, or it gets brought in on the page. Uh, the thing is, is that allocators also over time do cause fragmentation, and these things do get spread out. So there's no, there's no guarantees that this is going to actually help one way or the other. Um, and a lot of the locality that actually arises is really within objects, not so much across objects, I believe. Uh, I, I, I argue. Uh, yes, it has been measured. OK, so what does mesh do? So mesh employs randomization. Uh, so actually, mesh is a deeply, it's like riven with randomization. Uh, it's full of random algorithms. Um, and I'm going to explain the mechanism of how it works. But the idea of randomization is to ensure that things are spread out and reduce the likelihood of these worst cases, uh, which you can, in fact, reason about because it's random. Um, so just to show you this is a real problem, uh, we built a mesh version that actually has no randomization and compared it to mesh with randomization. And uh, it turns out, you can see this gap between the two, right? Mesh was unable, like they're both trying to reclaim memory. But without randomization, you run into the situation where it's just not possible. Yes? Do, do, you, have, do you have that same diagram that shows the actual amount of allocated heat? It would be interesting to see 
even with mesh, how much you're giving up, basically? Allocated heat. In other like the live objects. The, the total, total number total, of live objects. The total count of live objects. The total number of live objects should be the same. No, no, but I mean, in terms of, you know, like, what, what are the total fraction is being wasted compared to the, the actual objects that are being in use? In other words, anyway, we can talk about that. Okay, I mean, I think that this is, this is meant to capture exactly that, right? So this is the resonance set size. That's what the y-axis means. So this is literally a count of the number of pages yeah, that yeah, are I'm in memory. About, but yeah. I'm talking about actually, but anyway. All right, okay, okay. <laughs> all right. We'll, we'll talk about see it how much there. waste there is after this. Okay, yeah. all right, sounds good. Yeah. All right, so, um, so this immediately begs the question, how do we randomize the allocation? So turns out that we have done this before, um, but our previous approaches don't work at all. All right, and you'll see why. So um, they, they kind of can be viewed at a high level as a kind of random probing. Um, so what is random probing? It's actually very similar to the way hashing works. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to go and try to find a random offset. And if it's free, we'll allocate it. All right, and if that fails, then we'll try again. All right, so we're just going to be like, I randomly pick some offset. It appears to be empty. Great, I say malloc. All right, and then I do it again, and I can do it again. And this is a technique, roughly uh, the technique that we employed in this paper in PLDI 2006. This is uh, me and Ben, um, that won a most influential paper award, um, and, uh, and led to all kinds of good stuff in, in Windows allocators. All right, so this is great. It's very simple, but unfortunately, you can kind of think about it. Like, as I keep allocating objects on this page, it gets less and less likely that I'll find an empty one by randomly probing. Right? It gets more full, more full, more full. Imagine it's 99% full. My odds of a successful probe are now 1%. That's not good. That means the inexpectation I have to do 100 times. That would be really bad. Right? So it's fast, but only if the page occupancy is low, which is exactly what we don't want. Right? Like our goal is to maximize memory efficiency. So we're not going to be like, well, let's make it random. And we'll waste like three times as much memory. And well, random will be fast. Hooray, win. Right? That's not a win. So uh, we had to do something different. So we came up with this, this uh, nice little algorithm uh, that we call a shuffle vector. So I'll explain how a shuffle vector works. The cool part about a shuffle vector is that it's both fast and space efficient. Uh, and it's really simple. Um, and it's so simple that, like, I, I worry that it has been invented by like like somewhere buried in Knuth. Uh, there's something, right? Um, so let me just show you what the idea is. Um, so what we do is we take a page and we divide it into uh, numbers corresponding to each offset. Uh, and it turns out we can actually represent these very compactly uh, because the smallest object size uh, for most systems is 16 bytes. And a page is 4K, which means there's no more than 256 of them, which is one byte. Uh, so we can measure, we can have each one represented as a byte. Uh, and then we throw those all into this thing that is this, what we call a shuffle vector. And each thread has its own. All right. Then we perform a uh, shuffle. So this is the um, uh, Knuth Fisher Yates shuffle uh, that randomizes, guarantees the randomization of the order. Once we've done that, everything from that point on is going to be big O of one. So when we call malloc, all we basically do is we pop off the first one. All right, so we go and we say malloc, we grab the two, and then we, we use this, the second object's offset. When we call free, what we do is we then pick a random victim and swap it. All right, and so we basically preserve this, this kind of queue that we can just pull from. So we basically go pop, 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 and when we say push, we just pick a random one to replace it with, and it maintains a random order. And so it's big O of one, and it uses all of the available memory without random probing, all right? And that's it. And so once we do this, we actually get a very high likelihood that we'll get lots of meshable pages. The emptier the pages are, the more likely it is that they'll be able to mesh, all right? Uh, and we have like theoretical results in the, uh, in the paper. Uh, essentially, as the available space goes up, the probability of finding larger numbers to mesh uh, asymptotically approaches one. Yes? Seems to assume you're doing only all this, all the allocations are the same size. But you said earlier that you uh, had you, you wanted to give them about close to what their requested size was. Yeah. So okay. So let's see. So um, so the the deal is that normally when you have fragmentation, it can arise when you mix objects of different sizes. When you separate objects of different size, the problem is that you're maybe consuming more pages than you need to. Uh, when you free objects from these set of pages that are for objects of size, let's say 64, and these are for objects of size 56, 
suddenly you can't reuse them, right? So that's bad. So we do the meshing within those size classes. Each of them can reclaim all the empty space, and that can be recycled for use by other size classes. Does that answer the question? Yes. Okay, great. Yes. Just to clarify, each yeah. page can have only a single size class. Yes, that's exactly right. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Otherwise, the shuffle vector thing wouldn't work, right? They all have to be uniform, right? Okay. What's the, the complexity of the original shuffle? Um, so the very first shuffle you do yeah. is order n, but it okay. then is um, so it's order n to do the shuffle, but then it's amortized over the allocations, so it's amortized big O of one. All right. Okay, so finding pages to mesh is another challenge. So I said there's pages and they're unlikely to, uh, like you're likely to be able to find meshing candidates, but you might think, okay, yeah, problem solved. But it's like, well, there's like a shit ton of pages out there. How do you find the ones, like how do you do this? Uh, so you could just do an N squared comparison. That would be, that, that will work. Um, it will be extremely slow. Uh, it's, um, and by extremely slow, I mean like it will slow things down by like 50 or 100x. So that's no good. So we want to be able to quickly find some meshing that is going to maximize the number of pages that we're going to release with the minimal amount of time. All right, so this is challenging, and I'll explain why it's challenging. Um, so first, uh, so it, it runs in the slow path of free. Every so often we wake up and we say, okay, we're going to go and we're going to reclaim some memory. We're going to find this meshing. We're going to treat each size class independently. That's good. Here's the thing. Um, if you consider this a graph and you draw an edge between every page that could mesh with every other page, right? So you have a page here and a page here and they could mesh, then you draw a line between them, all right? So that's what this is a picture of. Uh, then finding the, the meshing that is the pairing uh, that releases the maximum number of pages uh, is min clique cover, um, which is in the famous book of NP complete problems. Um, so that's not great. All right, seems like a bad start. Um, however, uh, randomization to the rescue. It turns out that using randomization actually allows us to solve a simpler problem, uh, which is efficiently solvable, called graph matching. Um, and graph matching is not an NP-complete problem. Uh, it can be done efficiently. Uh, and then we get approximate graph matchings with high probability. So the classic situation that arises with randomization. Um, there is a trick. If you actually explicitly built this graph, that would be very bad. Uh, it'd be slow and it could consume a lot of memory. So we implicitly operate on the graph. We have an algorithm we call split measure. Uh, and so split measure, uh, it approximates matching without actually creating the graph. Uh, and we do this, I'm just going to walk you through to give you a feel of how this works. Uh, so you have a bunch of pages. Uh, you want to find pairs of meshable pages. So we keep uh, two vectors of pages. And we iterate, and we just compare them, all right? And we see if they're meshable, all right? And the way that we do this, we actually have a bit index. Uh, so each one has a bit that indicates whether it's occupied or not. And so you just say, here's a bit vector, here's a bit vector. Uh, and if you and them and there's any ones, then you know that they can't be meshed. So that's done very efficiently, all right? Then we loop again, uh, and we loop in this modular way. All right, now you might be thinking this is really deterministic and weird, but the way we actually populate this vector is we randomly order it. So this effectively gives us a random walk over the graph. And it turns out that once we do this, you can actually guarantee with a small number, in fact, a constant number of iterations, that you will find a successful mesh with high probability. Uh, and once it finds it, it removes the found mesh and it continues. So it's a uh, you know, the beauty of randomized algorithms, by the way, so obviously I'm in love with randomized algorithms. Um, I should marry a randomized algorithm. Um, I'm sure my wife feels like she married a randomized algorithm. Um, but uh, the beauty is the algorithms are almost always devastatingly simple. It's just the analysis that's complicated. So the implementation is actually like iterate through vectors, look for matches, right? I mean, there's hardly anything to it. And then you randomly shuffle them, and then magic happens. So it's, it's quite nice. So the, actually, like, the code complexity is very low. All right, so like I said, split measure uh, achieves this goal of finding these candidate pages to mesh uh, with high probability. It operates very quickly. Uh, so it is a big O of n over q time. So q is the probability of spans meshing, which is related to the occupancy of, of spans overall. Like I said, as the, the, the meshes, uh, I'm sorry, as the pages get emptier and emptier, then Q gets higher and higher, and you only run this when you need more memory. Yes? So 
So it seems like I, th I didn't hear you say anything about ordering the pages you're trying to mesh by, by the occupancy. Is that true? You don't sort by occupancy? We do. We also do that. Oh, yeah. so how does that how does that fit in? It's a, so and with <laughs> okay. with constant time, uh, I, it's very easy to do. Basically, every time we free something, uh, we see how full it is. Uh -huh. uh, we just keep a count, uh, and then we move it onto a different array. Uh, and then right. you like, randomly choose from that array to do then the we issue. then we generate the yeah then we randomly okay. choose. So from there's that some thing. threshold basically that if you hit a certain threshold in occupancy. So I don't remember exactly okay. what we divide it by, but it's some fraction like uh, like everything is in a one eighth category or a one fourth category or something Are like there that. Multiple occupancy. Yes. Categories? Yeah. Yeah. There's like either for because it obviously the higher the occupancy, the more work it is to. Yeah. So we always try to uh, to favor. Uh, meshing things that are mostly empty, right. uh, you have a higher success rate, and it then is, is very likely to succeed. It's not just very likely to succeed, it's going to reclaim a lot of memory relative to the number of live objects. Right. Yep, good question. Um, so this is a one-half approximation to matching uh, with high probability, which is great. Uh, it's surprisingly close. Yes? Is there a way to say, um, try to prefer meshed uh, pages that are uh, local, so that we don't move across numbers too much? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. So this is something that, um, you know, random is a bit at odds with. Uh, so, so the question is basically, so if you have two different um, domains, so if you have a large computer system, you may have non-uniform memory access. So some cores may be able to access some memory faster than more distant memory. So this is referred to as NUMA. And so in those settings, you would really like to keep the memory local Right, so it's like Vegas, right? You want to keep anyway. Uh, sorry, old dated reference, um, but you want to keep things close, okay? Um, this is just straight up a challenge. Um, so finding out where things live requires OS support. It's an expensive call. Uh, deciding whether this is a good thing to do in general is hard. Uh, objects move, like people write programs that you know. Yeah, you allocated it on this node, but then you use it on this other node. So for me, Numa is just kind of. Um, Super complicated. It's interactions with an allocator, and I mostly have. In so weirdly, I saw a paper uh, just the other day on Horde uh, that was like, "Hey, and Horde works really great for Numa," and I was like, "That's just a freaking miracle. Uh, that is a hundred percent an accident." Um, so we thought about it, but we don't really see a good way to do it. So I mean, we'd we'd welcome suggestions. So good question. All right. So um, I'm wrapping up. Like I said, mesh works. Uh, it's really fast. Uh, it's very space efficient. So you saw the results for Redis and Redis plus mesh, right? So it basically has very little impact on runtime for ordinary Redis operations. But then when it's doing compaction, it speeds things up a ton. Uh, for Firefox, it reduces the amount of space considerably. Um, one cool thing is that um, Mesh actually is really interesting for PL researchers as well, I think, as a substrate for implementing uh, their own programming languages. So it turns out that making a concurrent compacting garbage collector is super hard. <laughs> super hard. Uh, it is notoriously error prone. Um, there actually are cases, for example, there is a compacting concurrent garbage collector that was created at Sun for the Java virtual machine, and they eventually deprecated it because they couldn't get it right. Um, yeah, so that's, that's unfortunate. Uh, so it was in hotspot for a period of time. And then I think after 1.4.2, they were like, and we're done with this allocator, or this collector. Um, and the problem is, is that you just have a lot of moving parts. A lot of things are happening. So what this means is that you know the people who make Python, the people who make Ruby, are not like job one is making a compacting concurrent garbage collector. So here, you could, in principle, build a garbage collector that actually goes and reclaims the memory and calls free on top of mesh. And Ruby basically actually goes and uses, for some object sizes, unfortunately not all, it uses malloc. Uh, and so we can literally plug in mesh into Ruby, and we get space savings automatically, uh, which is cool. So it would be really interesting to see Python use it, for example. Python has its own elaborate, insane custom memory allocation management thing, so we can't easily plug it in. Probably if we stripped it out, we would save like 30,000 lines of code, and then it would be more efficient and would be more space efficient. Um, but anyway, this is a kind of a cool thing that would be a nice other use case for Mesh, not just for C and C++. Um, so that's basically it. Uh, you can download it. It's on GitHub. Um, 
and you get compacción sin relocación, uh, which is great. Um, and uh, if you go to this uh, to the Plasma site, um, Plasma is my lab at UMass, uh, and we have all kinds of software that we have built uh, that is all publicly available. And there's papers and talks and other fun stuff there. And thank you for your attention. Yes. Hey. Uh, so when you when you talk about meshing these different pages together, uh, it's it seems like it's always done the same way. But have you thought about transposing phase, um, pages so that you know if you did like a 180 degree rotation, um, then you know if, if the allocation was kind of was always left to right, top to bottom, um, but if you like rotated a page and then meshed it together. Maybe, maybe so, that would give you more opportunities to merge. So this is very evocative, but I don't understand how it would work. And so I think you'll probably have to explain it to me offline. Sure. But to me, like, I mean, the, the 2D nature of this thing is maybe it, it's an illusion for expository reasons, right? Really, it's just an array, right? So memory is kind of just a big line. Yeah. And so you have memory here, and it's occupied, and you, have, you can think of it as being ones and zeros. And then you're just comparing the ones and zeros. And so if you and them together and you get zero, it means nothing collided. Yeah. So there's no actual sort of left to right or, or yeah. like, like my hands do this, but that's not the, what the program sure. does. But you could imagine some kind of rotation also applied to. I mean, I think the, the, the question is what happens to virtual addresses, right? So the virtual addresses have to, be, have to remain intact in this world. Um, so yeah, so again, I'm not 100% sure, but I, we can talk about it. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Maybe I can ask a variant of that question. You can okay. imagine simpler to implement forms of randomization. Like instead of randomizing the location of every object within a page, just like offsetting all of the objects with one random number. Yeah. Yeah, you could. So um, so that's so the question is basically like you know, why not make a simpler version that's not so random, right? Um, so there's a couple reasons for it. So first, it's actually pretty efficient. It's not clear that there would be a win. The only question is whether there's a locality win, which is plausible. Um, but I worry that the regular allocation patterns of programs, where they kind of stripe things together, would just lead to the meshing not working. It would be something we could explore. Um, the nice thing about randomly allocating everything is that you can also analyze it mathematically. And analyzing the thing you describe, I'm sure somebody can analyze it mathematically. I mean, to, you know, to be clear, uh, I did not analyze all of these things mathematically, right? So I have two co-authors. One is a student, David, uh, and the other is Andrew McGregor, who's a, a theoretician. And so like, I made the very first theorems. Like, if you read the paper, there's like the baby theorems. And like, I did the baby theorems. And then like, the crazy, amazing theorems were developed by them, right? And this is, it's like, already hard enough. So, I mean, I guess, you know, full-time employment plan for, uh, for theoreticians, but yeah, I'm not sure it's, it, I'm, I'm, it might be really, really hard. All right. Yeah, done. I want to add some, a great presentation, by the way. Thank awesome you. work. I really, yeah, every time you do this, every right, year you come back, it's like right, you do <laughs> 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 I wanted to add some evidence to your observation where you said, like, probably the locality of of allocating in the beginning, mm -hmm. later it's fragments, right? Um, yeah. Doesn't matter. Because I, I did also a variant of an email where I did uh, for security, like randomized allocation, and I could only measure the tiniest of difference in performance. So I, I yeah. think, right, so locality on modern computers is different, right? I think if, as long as you're in the same area, you're good enough. Right, perhaps, right. Like, yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's like all things with locality, it's like it depends, right? You can imagine workloads where it would be bad, but I think that it's, if you're relying on the allocator to provide you with locality, you're probably making a mistake. Right. Yeah. It's a bad bet. Okay. All right. Well, let's thank you. Great. Thanks again. Thanks again.